What a lovely <laughs> hymn. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, when we sing these beautiful hymns, I, can, I was raised in, um, raised in South Wales in the, in the village of Slangai, and I was trying to work out when I saw John, how do I, I do recognise him, but I don't know from where. So, um, but it might well have been from Calvaria Baptist in Slangaina, and I can remember when I was a, a, young, a young boy singing that, um, that hymn. It's just going nowhere. And, you know, you, you listen to the tune, you think, oh, come on. Um, and then you're born again, and it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, I'm come to my heart with our wonderful love. Come and abide. Yeah. You know, lifting my life till it rises above envy and falsehood. And pride. You know, it's our men every two words, isn't it? Isn't, and it's wonderful. And, yeah. you know, I'm so glad to be here this evening and, you know, as I always say um, before um, uh, the, these meetings about Romania, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that the Christian life is not about Romania. Christian life is about serving the Lord where and how he has called us to serve him. Um, you know, so often, sometimes we might think, well, my best years are behind me. There we go. I look back on the past, and I'm sure Moses did at the age of 79, and the Lord said to him, well, you haven't seen anything yet. Um, and, and that's what we need to remember. Um, I will tell you very, very briefly. I mean, I know that dear John and Alan have something to do with support for Romania and, um, and Alan Penrose. And, um, and there are people, many people around who are very interested in Romania. I was not one of them for many, many years. Um, I was converted at the age of 19. Um, I knew from the start, uh, you know, the Lord had called me to be a pastor, but my dad insisted I get a, get a secular job for nine years. He said I needed experience in life to become a little less wet behind the ears, and so I was, I was an accountant for nine years. And then um, I, I became a pastor, and, and, that, and that was it. Um, I, I cannot say that I had any special interest in, in mission work. I can say <laughs> I used to dread meetings like this. <laughs> I used to think, well, maybe there'll be some, you know, some interesting thought share from the word. After that, I'm going to sleep. And, and I can remember when Irene and I, this is quite serious, when Irene and I were just going out, boyfriend and girlfriend, Irene said to me, well, maybe one day we'll go as missionaries somewhere. And I remember thinking, never! <laughs> I didn't say it because I valued the relationship, but that's what I was thinking. How did it change then? It's a fair question, isn't it? And the interesting thing is this, it was like a second conversion. It really, really was. I was... I, know, I wasn't young at this point, I was 33, 34. So kind of you feel you're set, don't you? You know, this is the way I'm going. I'm going to be an English pastor in English church all my life. Um, but what happened when, when Romania came into the, um, the European Union, um, right in that month, January 2007, a Romanian man came to our church, invited me to go to Romania every time I saw him. If I saw him 50 times a week, 50 invitations, it was just like one of those, um, you could almost set your clock by it, you know, about 30 seconds before the end of our meeting, Adrian, come to Romania. No, 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 no. And I said to, her, I said to Irene, I said, I, I don't think Cornell's going to give me any peace. <laughs> He's going to keep asking me until the Lord returns, I really feel. And so I'm going to go. Five days, that's it. Never again. And that's how it felt for the first two days. It really did. And um, I can remember being over there, hating it. And I thought, well, five days. I'd be happy with two days, I'd be happy with no days, but <laughs> I was there. I really was. I was terribly homesick. Um, I, I've never been homesick in my life, but, you know, I was there. And the strange thing, which even to this day, I can only explain as being the Lord's hand, was the Sunday when we were there, and, and that sense of, you know, one's heart just kind of becoming one with the Romanian cause and the Romanian people. And first thing I said when I got back home on, Crystal put on the Tuesday, I said, Daddy, I'm going to learn Romanian. Oh. Do you know my wife? I really said, oh, no. <laughs> but that's how it started, my dear ones. That's how it started. Now, um, and um, that was 2007. Now, as I was saying to John, I'm, my main work now, I'm actually pastor of a Romanian church in Bristol. Yes. And um, it's always quite interesting because, um, you know, when we, we go to the different churches, and you know, Irene and I sometimes feel quite young. But in our church, in our fellowship, we are the old people. We are the old people. We have six people who are in their 50s or early 60s. We have one person, I think, who's 62, and that's it. And the rest are children and young people and couples and things like that. And 
you know, everyone thinks it's a huge plus and a benefit, but you, know, you do have that sense that the congregation is alive. You never know when some little kid is going to make a, a run for his friend on the other side of the room, and, and vice versa, and that's, that's real church. But we would, pr- we would ask for your, your, um, your prayers for our church. We, it's always an exercise in um, self-awareness and the awareness of our weakness when we are pastoring. So please do pray for the Holy Spirit. Um, as he has done in the past, to continue with us. That's what we need. Um, please do pray for Irene and me as well. I was just saying a little to John. Um, for the last 16 years, we've been um, very involved with the, the Romanian gypsy community in Bristol. And um, so you can imagine, uh, we bring a great minibus of them in on a Sunday morning plus one car. So you can imagine a very, very, uh, the, su- the Sunday morning church, English church, not the Romanian church, English church on Sunday morning, very reformed very conservative, very quiet, and our gypsy kids come in. You know, and, you know, how's my hair looking past and that sort of thing. And, and, and that's it. And, um, and that's the one side of it. The other side of it is, of course, the suffering. I mean, what our gypsy kids go through, beggars belief. And sometimes, I think Irene and I would say, we watch it and we're not quite sure what to do sometimes. But we can pray and we can love. We can get alongside and we can say that we're in it for the long haul by the calling of the Lord. And just a, a final word of introduction. Please do pray for that as well, the Gypsy Children's work. Um, mm-hmm. Just about these dear paintings. I was so interested talking to Alan about um, epidermolosis bullosa, the um, butterfly skin syndrome. There's a dear Romanian lady called Florina. I think she's now 23 years old. It's one year less than the, the, the year 2024. She's 2023. <coughs> she's 23. And um, she has it very badly, this epidermolosis bullosa. And um, she doesn't have any hands. So if you look at, um, in the, the annual report there, you'll see a photograph of her, and she's got the, the, the things taper off around here at the, at the wrist, and these tiny little baby fingers underneath the skin at the end of her hands and, and of her arms. And, um, yeah, and she has a tough time. Um, it's been very hot in the main. The mid 30s, even up to 40 and, and, and above, and you get a little bit of you know a layer of perspiration, the friction increases with the clothes, and oh, it's gonna it's gonna wreak havoc. To be honest, it really is. And you know I I've seen Florina you know well, on times, and the depth of the the wounds go right around her neck where the collar is and things like that, and it's hard because. She goes to the Pentecostal church there, which is very good in some ways, but they are convinced this is due to parental and grandparent sin. And the expression they use over in Romania is this, and maybe Al has heard it, that um, your, your grandparents, they fill up, with their sins, they fill up the cup so far. Your parents, with their sins, fill up the cup a little bit further. And then when you were born, you drink it. And... It's the sad thing about it. It's very plausible. Ah, okay. So that, that makes sense. But it's not what the Bible says. No. And, you know, you, you go to them and you say, well, what about John chapter 9? This is for the glory of the Lord, ultimately. And, and they just look at you as if you're stupid, that sort of thing. So what we do with dear Florina, she paints. She holds the brush between her, her wrists and she paints. And I will show you two more things. So here we are. They are lovely, aren't they? Aren't they lovely? And what we do, we sell them for hundred pounds each. Every single penny goes to Florina. And if there's any taxation, we'll work out that and we'll pay that ourselves. But it's so nice. I mean, she's it's a very, very solitary, lonely life. And it's so good to be able to encourage her in that way. So if you like one of the paintings, this is what I normally say to people. If you like one, the normal price is a hundred pounds. If you really, really, really like one, it's two hundred pounds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, <I'm> <laughs> now, my loves, I, I, I was so happy, I couldn't believe it when I was on the telephone to Alan um, last week and I, I said, okay, Al, what's the, um, what's the, uh, you know, the, 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 the layout, the format of the meeting? He said, have as long as you want. <laughs> and I thought, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of a Pentecostal church I once went to down in Truro, John, and it was called the, the full Gos- International Full Gospel Church. They're a great crowd. And I remember um, being with a pastor there and before the meeting, and I kind of, with trepidation, went up to him and said, Alan, you know, I'm 
So sorry, it might be 50 minutes. It might be 50 minutes this morning. And he looked at me with this horrified expression. He said, oh, Adrian, not less than one hour. Not less than one hour. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, but what, 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 what it is, dear ones, is, what is so nice is that well, you, you've got your order of services. We have a little 10-minute meditation in a second. You can see what we've got there. Um, we'll go through the projects. Go through the projects. Each one, as I said, is, is trying to help people fulfill their God-given call. So someone has a call to do this or to minister to children. As we see, go into prisons. But so often, you know, they have the call, but they don't have the resources. So you've got this fire burning in their hearts to do this, do that, but not the resources. So this is where we come in. This is where we show ourselves a family in the Lord Jesus, to help together, and, um, and through that, um, to, to, um, to, to finance these ministries. And, and it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. So I will just explain a little bit more. One, three, and five in detail. All right? Just in case we get to the end of number one and you think, he's never going to finish. Two and four in summary. So those, those will just be two minutes each. All right. But what I like to do is to combine things so that we get more of a flavor of everything that's going on. But maybe as well in our prayers later, we can especially remember Florina and um, what she is, is going through and, and encourage her that way. Let's turn to John chapter 17, please. Um, I had planned a different meditation, um, but as... I was driving over here, and earlier today I thought we'll go for this one instead. So a very short meditation from the Word of God. Oh, we thank the Lord for the Word, don't we? There is nothing like it. Um, oh, sorry. That's, that's right. I thought that was me. Um, but we, we really are, are just a few thoughts, really. This is not an in-depth study. Just a few thoughts um, in relation to verse 3. But let us read from John chapter 17. We'll read from verses 1 through to 5. May the Lord bless and speak to our hearts as we know he can. John 17 verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they might may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you in the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We turn back then to verse 3. And it's just really some evangelistic and otherwise reflections on verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, dear ones, as I said, I come from Bristol. Irene and I have driven here from Bristol this afternoon. In Bristol, we have a community of approximately 10,000 Romanian people. So that's like a big village, isn't it? Or small town, 10,000 Romanian people. There are times when I feel I've had coffee with most of them. <laughs> and I have spoken to them, and I have asked them sometimes, but well, what was it that brought you to Bristol, what, what, what was it that caused you to, to leave Romania, come to Bristol, come to the UK? It's not, a, not an easy thing to do. So what was it that caused you to come here? And what is so interesting is this, is that almost invariably, they will then use the exact same form of words, the exact same expression. And they will say, I came here for a better life. A better life. And when I hear that, I sometimes say to them, well, what do you mean by a better life? What do you mean by better life? They say, well, are we going to talk about salaries? We're going to talk about hospitals. We're going to talk about schools. We're going to talk about government. All that sort of thing. And I say to them, my dear ones, what you are talking about here, especially in terms of money, money is what I would call an easier life. An easier, a more comfortable life, absolutely. But I don't think really the vision you have is that of a better life. 
And they might say to me, well, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And I say to them, please, can I give you just a few examples, a few famous examples of those people who seem to have had the better life, but in actual fact didn't. They said, go ahead. I said, I want to talk about the first one is Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. We've got some slightly older people here. You might remember the name Howard Hughes. Six feet, four inches tall. An absolute genius of a man. He was there in Hollywood, directing blockbusting films. Absolute top man. You know, Howard Hughes was the inventor of the modern hospital bed. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but he actually invented the modern hospital bed. Howard Hughes invented and then flew the, the biggest aeroplane that, that in the world at that time. And not just did he have those things, but he had a personal fortune estimated in today's money to be worth four billion dollars. And yet at the end of his life, he said I would exchange it all for a few good friends. Did he have a better life? No. So, well, well, there we go. They say, oh, I'm not persuaded yet. I say, okay, I'm going to talk about Adam Peaty. Adam Peaty, the greatest British swimmer in history. Absolutely. Olympic gold medal 2016, Olympic gold medal 2021. And if you're watching a few weeks ago, silver medal this time, still incredible. Adam Peaty. There was a time when he held the fastest 20 times, the 20 fastest times for his event in the whole world. Extraordinary. A man seen and reckoned to be the greatest British swimmer of all time. And then we hear, in 2023, of him saying an Olympic gold medal is the coldest thing in the world because it cannot comfort you in your sorrows. And he said, my, my finger is always over the self-destruct button in my life. Did he have a better life? No. They say they're still not convinced. I say, I want to talk about someone called Tom York. Tom York, now this is a bit more my generation. Radiohead, Tom York. Tom York, reckoned to be one of the best um, singers of the last 50 years, or pop singers, if that counts, if that counts. Radiohead, exceptionally successful pop, band, pop group. Tom York was asked, why do you write the songs? Why do you write the songs? He said, so that the holes in my heart might go away. The interviewer said to him, you've written many songs over many years. How are the holes? How are the holes? Apparently he paused for a long moment and then said, they're still there. Did he have a better life? Well, sometimes my remainers are still not convinced. So I said, I'll go for the last one, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sad. Kenneth Williams, obviously famous, rich, comedian, absolutely, wasn't he? What's very interesting is that he, he was well known to the, um, to the staff of All Souls Church in, in London. And um, Richard Buse, the, the rector there, said on the day before Kenneth Williams died, he actually saw Kenneth Williams and Kenneth Williams saw him, but Kenneth Williams jerked his head away pretending that he hadn't seen anything. And he died, didn't he? I wonder if anyone here knows the last thing Kenneth Williams wrote in his, his diary before he died. What's the point? He, what's the point? He, he did add in a swear word, John, but what's the point? What's the point? Did he have a better life? No. Dear ones, this is the world. This is the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. So many people are going this way. We pick out the ones and the twos in their pursuit of mirages, forgetting sometimes that so many of the Western world are following. We are stung by these things because they affect us. I was raised in the Garu Valley. Some of you might know, famous for the prevalence of youth suicide. 
I have two friends who committed suicide. One when he was 32, one when he was 38. How incredibly sad it is. I think it's so important for us to not be deceived by the world. You know, I sometimes we go to churches and we ask. Our hearts hurt when we think, where are the young people? And I do think this, that they have been deceived by the world. Yeah. Yeah. And the mirages and the false promises. These people, these celebrities who are there to, to pass comment on the, the myriad different destinations, say there's nothing there. How we need to pray for the Lord to use even that, that these people might listen, sorry, the world might listen and hear and realize I'm on the wrong road. And of course, the the follow-on question from that was, what is the right road? What is the life? Certainly not just a theoretical question for me. I became a Christian when I was 19, through depression. The vanity of life. What in the world is the point of it all? Irene and I were here quite early today. We were walking up and down the road. I was talking to the big lady just across the way. Very tempted to say, do you know? Do you know? It's so sad when people say, there is none. Do you know, John, they do, they do say that in university. Yeah, we're from a university town. They do say that. There is no point in life. What is the life? Make of it what you will. And then we come to John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life. Mm -hmm. To know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Always. This is. This is. You could have said that when Adam and Eve were walking in the garden. This is eternal life to know you, the living God. It was said by our Lord Jesus 2,000 years ago. And it is totally true today, my dear ones. This is. And until our Lord Jesus returns, this is always true. This is always true. This is eternal life. Eternal life. So people are saying, well, maybe if I you know, look around and fish here and there, I might find some kind of life. But is it not hinted at, at least in this verse, if not more, that you can find more than just life in this world. You can get a taste of the life to come. This is eternal life, but even now, as we come to, into a relationship with the Lord Jesus, a taste of the full feast is given to us. This is eternal life to know. To know someone. And this is what I find interesting. Because I think sometimes people have a, a hunch about this. It's, I need to know someone. And they go hiving off into a thousand different relationships. Trying to idolize the good relationships they have and Find again, no living water in that. But it is about knowing someone. Yeah. And the answer is this. It's God through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's God through Jesus Christ. Mm. This is eternal life. Mm. To know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Mm. Now, I just got a couple of applications, <laughs> then we're going to go to the, the remaining talk, but they're important ones, because I believe the Lord has put them on my heart. So I would, I really would ask you to um, remember these. This is the message we have to share. This is the message we have to share with people. This great gospel message. Let's always be looking for opportunities to share this. But some people can come back and say, well, How? How? There's that big lady across the, the way. We parked our car outside her house. She didn't look particularly happy about it. But then that's all right because we had a little talk afterwards and everything was fine. 
So how do we share it with them? How do we share this message with them? And I will tell you something I believe with all my heart. Here I go. I'm going to tell you something which I have found the Lord has laid on my heart and I want to share with you today. If we get to know someone properly, we get to know someone properly. So, you know, it's not just superficial. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a bond there. We've got to know someone. I've said this to everyone. If someone has half an hour real conversation with somebody who trusts them, there will always be a perfect door into the gospel somewhere in that conversation. As they talk about their hurts, their hopes, their this, their that, once they open up, the door will come. But we've got to build the relationships. <laughs> I, 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 I'm telling you my experience that if they really, if they trust us, if they don't trust you, they say, hello, how are you? Fine, good, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if they trust you, in half an hour's conversation, real conversation, you'll find a perfect door for the gospel and the Holy Spirit in this beautiful, gracious way. will say, now speak. It's not forced. It's not uglier in any way. It's beautiful. We can talk about the gift of life. So that's, that's one of the applications, you know. If we have real friendships and real contact, half an hour, try it. And you'll see, there'll be something that they say and you think, that is it, gospel. And it's not forced, it's beautiful, it's lovely. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Secondly, slightly challenging here, but challenge is good for us. If it comes from the Lord, praise his name. This is eternal life, to know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here it is. We know him. Could we know him more? Mm -hmm. We have a relationship with him. Yeah. Could it be closer? Yeah. Through prayer, godly living, a denial of the world, a renouncing of the world, and an embracing in our lives wholeheartedly our Lord Jesus Christ. We all understand the pull and the draw of the world. But when these things stop us from embracing the fullness of a close relationship with the Lord Jesus, mm. these sometimes neutral things of the world are not so neutral after all. Mm. That's a thought, isn't it? You know, could we come closer to the Lord and to know more of this life? That's sharing it to with others here, <laughs> knowing it more in our own lives, and sharing it in Romania and the Ukraine. I'm going to Ukraine as well this evening. I think life is hard everywhere. I say that I'm 50 years old. I feel like now I've clocked up the half century. I can say it, John. I can say, <laughs> life is hard everywhere. But it's really hard over there. And you see the children and many others and their faces tell a thousand stories that they will never share with you personally but you know those stories are there. And what is the greatest thing we want to say to them? This is eternal life. To know Jesus Christ. To know the living God. Jesus Christ, whom he sent. That's our message. That's why we're doing this. I tell people, dear ones, I don't get a penny for doing this work. Not one penny. Yeah. That's, that's why. So that we have the honor and privilege of saying to them, this is eternal life. To know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Let's go to Romania. <laughs> what if we could knock the lights off, please, and we can then um, uh, we can then go and see the pictures um, as well as we can. I'm going to be careful not to wander too far away from the um, microphone. I'll just stay here, shall I? And um, 
we will turn any any off that can go off. Is there one, there's one more, more lot to go? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Is, will we have a go for these ones? These, these ones as well, or? Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we got some remaining. <laughs> but you know, dear ones, I'm, I'm sure the Lord gave me that meditation, dear ones, for you today. I really, I'm sure of that. So let's really think about you know what um, what's been said about sharing the words. <laughs> And um, remember those points, especially the point about, oh, you know, the real relationships and half an hour's conversation. I really mean that. And as people talk, start to open up what's in their hearts, there will be um, many and different ways of, of sharing the gospel. Now, I have got a, a pointer here, which is a dangerous thing to put in my hand, but Al, I'm going to go for it. And it's the down to move forward, isn't it? So um, there we go. Dear ones, once again, thank you so much for the invitation today. You know, it's a, it's a privilege to be here. It's a joy to be here. Irene and I were really do enjoy going out to to visit the different churches. You know, I, one of the things we say to people, there are, there are more of us than we think. You know, we might come this evening, we think, not many of us here, but you know, there are churches, many churches, yeah. and there are more of us than we think. The Lord's people are more numerous than the Lord's, the Lord's people sometimes fear. Mm-hmm. And we praise the Lord for that. Now, um, we're going to have a look at um, a few different uh, uh, ministries in a minute. As I said, one, three, and five in, in detail, two and four, we're going to skate over, just to give us a feel for the different areas. But I think we've probably got a point here, haven't we, as well? Yeah. So that's our, um, our strap line. What do we do in, in Romanian ministries? Well, we, we help Romanian Christians to minister, and we offer relief to Romania's poor. But as you'll see today, um, it's not just restricted to Romania, but further afield. But let's, um, let's see if this works. <laughs> where, where do I need to point this uh, out? Uh, hold on. Hold on. There we go. Change of mind, and it hasn't changed up there. So that's all right. Uh, that's all right. You can work the cursor over. The first area, dear ones, that we are looking at, the first area we are considering today, as you can see on the sheet. Two seconds. Yeah. <coughs> prisons. Prisons. We are talking about prisons. I don't know what sort. Of, what, you know what sort of feelings come to your mind when um when we mention prisons, <laughs> but often they are the last places people want to go. And um, what we're going to see, are we, are we ready to go on? Do you think this is going to work? It's going to work, praise the Lord. <laughs> and we're going to prison. There we go. Now, that beautiful yellow building there, many times, dear ones, I've asked people, what do you think that building is? And sometimes people have said, is it a hotel? And I've said, yes, it is a type of hotel. <laughs> they said, is, I've had people say, is it a monastery? I say, yes, it is a very unique type of monastery. It is a maximum security prison in Romania. And I don't know if any of us here have heard of one Mr. Andrew Tate. Mr. Andrew Tate, the the influencer in prison in Romania. There, there it was. Okay. So that's Ayud Prison in Romania. The sort of place normally we say, I don't want to go anywhere near. But the Lord calls people in. This dear man, you can see his name on the sheet, Cosmin Giorgio. Interesting story. 1995, he leaves university in Romania to, um, to go and work for a little while in Denmark, earn a bit of cash. While there, he meets with Danish Christians who want to come back and do evangelism in the Romanian prisons. All right, I'll go, said, said Cosmin, and he translated for them just like a robot, totally mechanical, nothing more. Realizing this was wrong, Cosmin prayed, and he said, Lord, please will you give me your heart for Ayud prison, where they'd gone. And Cosmin said, suddenly in that prayer, he found himself crushed with a sense of pain and love. I wonder, dear ones, would we be bold enough to say, maybe you have already, Lord, give me your heart for come there. Maybe he would give us that extraordinary experience of being crushed by pain and love for the souls of those around. Cosmin has a team. He started a ministry back in 1995. He's got a team. And he's got a couple of full-timers, the two sisters there either side. But come Easter or come Christmas, he could be going to those prisons with 120 Christians. Quite a lot of salt and quite a lot of light for their special services. You know, the, the remains a little bit that way. And you might say, well, what sort of services? And there are three different types. The main is like a, main type is like a Sunday service. You know, like you would have on a Sunday, preaching of the word and things like that. Second type is vocational training, preparing people with various training courses for the, the outside world. And the third is, is, is like here, which is what they call a family day. A family day 
time and you don't have all the partitions and the sections and the, the gaps and you can't etc etc but you can have time with your family and this of course a great blessing to the prisoners but what Cosmin and this is why we are involved what Cosmin is involved in doing he says whatever they do like a Sunday service vocational training family day he said it's prayer counseling the gospel and we sometimes are naturally a little bit unbelieving and think, well, does it make any difference? Hardened criminals, 722 maximum security prison criminals. Does it make any difference? Yes. Let me tell you about one person. That friendly looking angel, <laughs> Jon Klamparo, Capel de Pork, previous head of the Romanian mafia. May I just take three minutes to tell you very briefly Jordan Klamparu's story, probably the most famous criminal in the whole of Romania. Jordan Klamparu, he was brought up in an Adventist family. Mm -hmm. But his mother, he says, was a woman of the Bible. He described her as a woman of the book, brought up with four other siblings, but still he lost his way. Big, strong, strapping teenager gets into a fight at 19. Other person is killed. Manslaughter charge. 11 years inside prison. Um, Jordan Klamparu said, I went into prison, a confused teenager, I came out a wild animal. And he uses this word salbatik in Romania, which is a very strong word for a properly wild animal. And the chaos began. Very intelligent man, very organized, over to Spain to live. Soon in charge of a criminal empire of 6,000 associates. A lot of, lot of people. Interpol did the totting up and they reckoned that he had pocketed between 500 million and 5 billion euros. All the time living this highly secretive lifestyle. Very intelligent man. Everyone says almost completely uneducated, highly intelligent. Nobody knew where he lived. And the photograph Interpol used to try and track him down because he was on the most wanted list was eight years old. No one could find him, but they did find him. And they brought him into prison. 2012. Because we remember, and it's good to remember this, especially people like Andrew Tate around, the triumph of the wicked man is short. That's what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. Which prison in Romania did they take him to? Ayud prison. Cosmin was waiting. And before too long, wonder of wonders, big Yon Klamparu comes into one of the meetings. And Cosmin told me, Probably a similar, well, slightly bigger room than this. I've been in the, the room that they were, they held the meeting in. And young Klamparo just stood at the back. Poker face. Giving away nothing. Everyone was terrified of him. Now, Cosmin said the first thing that characterized that, that, that encounter was that nobody would look him in the eye. And he left the meeting utterly unimpressed, it seemed. Apparently then afterwards he came to some vocational training. A cooking course never associate mafia chiefs with cooking courses but people are people you know so he went to the cooking course and apparently Cosmin was saying you had this great big mafia boss with a, a tiny cooking partner and um, Cosmin said he wanted to take a photograph but you can't do that so um, he just marveled still not a flicker of an impression but things did change with one of those family days we were talking about the family days and young Clamparo even in his his dark ways he he loved his family he loved his family and um, especially his mother and it was on one of those family days that Jon Klamparu confessed this to Cosmin. He said, Cosmin, so it is of greater value to do one good thing, one good thing, than to gain the whole world through crime. And he'd almost gained the whole world. One good thing. Let's remember that next time we feel poor. One good thing. And um, Cosmin said the next meeting, weren't so many people there, but Big Yon Klampara was sitting ramrod straight and face was flushed, disappeared soon afterwards, and came back at the next meeting and said, I've been born again. This is eternal life, to know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And when people do, people change. The Lord takes the darkest soul. I have friends, my dear. Oh, I have friends in Romania. They will not accept 
that this man has been converted. Say, what about this? What about that? We'd probably say the same if we knew those things. The Son shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. We heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, I make all things new. It's been wonderful to hear about this man's growth in grace. He was converted in early 2023. I spoke to Cosmin in, in March 2024. Cosmin said to me, Do you know, Adrian, Yon Klamparu has been at every single service meeting that we've held in the last year. And when there was a big altercation problem between Yon Klamparu and a member of staff, a member of staff was probably speaking to him quite disrespectfully, and there was initially a reaction. Then in front of everyone later on, Yon Klamp, Klamparu went and humbled himself and said sorry. Wow! Mafia boss saying sorry. I always say at this point, my dear ones, who is the worst person you know? In the family? In the street? A colleague? And we think it's a waste of time. But the Lord is maybe waiting. To say, watch me breathe upon that person. The Lord Jesus came to the disciples and breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And this story from Clampoiro surely must give us hope for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. You might ask, my dear ones, what are we doing in Romanian ministries? What we're trying to do is to get started the family days in this prison here. Get out of the prison. Oh, I feel Richard Wurmbrand and everything. Get out of prison. Spent a lot of time in there. Yeah. But trying to get the family days started there, ready to sponsor them, but we can't get them. Cosby can't find staff to help him. So at the moment, we're praying for the staff to come in and start the family days in that salubrious looking <laughs> location. And we're also part sponsoring. Um, one of Cosmin's uh, full-time workers. I'm praying throughout for that voice from heaven to be heard in the prisons of Romania. Cosmin works in six prisons, between six and eight prisons. And in all those places, the voice of heaven to say, this is eternal life. For these prisoners, for these wicked men, to know Jesus Christ, the, 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 the living God in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent Pray for the prison ministries. What a wonderful thing. Is there a prison around here? Go and visit it. Have a go. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, we're going to go on to the next one. Um, so now we are just to give you a rough idea of where we're going to. Uh, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's there. It's either in Yash or Ployesh. And as it says on the sheet, it is football chaplaincy. Now, imagine, we can all remember Kevin Keegan, can't we? Yes. Kevin Keegan, yeah, you know, match of the day and all that. Friendly, chappy, top striker. Imagine if he became a Christian and were to go around speaking to professional footballers about the Lord. That'd be good, we'd say. Well, that's pretty much the story here. Um, Daniel Zafiris, top striker in Romania, was in the 1995 equivalent of the Romanian FA Cup on the winning side. So a well-known professional, ex-professional footballer. And um, he serves the Lord now in a number of different ways in the world of football. It's very interesting. I mean, one of the things he does, if I'm just go back a second, you see in these two places, the football team in Yash, very good football team there, Premier League team, football team in Ployesht, and Daniel, knowing the, um, the managers who are his, often his teammates from the past and things like that, he goes and spends a couple of days each month with the players and gets told incredible things from some of these crazy guys in the team in Ployesht. Um, Daniel was saying there was, a, there was one of those you know, you, you, know you, 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 you feel like you need a, a firearm to approach them, don't you, sometimes? They look so dangerous. Um, but he said there was this tattooed Romanian international footballer in Ployesht. And he came, up to, um, he came up to Daniel, and Daniel was wondering, you know, am I going to get it now? And this guy said, Daniel, will you pray for me? Of course, Daniel said. And Daniel said, well, why? And the, 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 the guy said, I've got, I, feel I've got, I feel I've got two demons in my heart. And he didn't specify, you know, is it drink and drugs? Is it kind of something in pornography or whatever? Wonderful opportunities there. Again, what I said about people, 
people trusting us. But what Daniel does as well is he'll run these amateur tournaments and, you know, there are the, the players and they've competed and, you know, lifted up the trophy and done their match of the days, you know, campione, campione, that sort of thing. And then after that will often come this time of testimony when Daniel in front of everyone will, will, will tell them how he became a Christian uh, and this will happen many times a year with the chaplaincy and also every week Daniel sends an evangelistic text message to 250 leading lights in the world of Romanian football, managers, leading players, etc, etc. And he's doing that. And we in Romanian ministries are so pleased to be able to sponsor Daniel in this incredible work. You know, if I went up to people and said, hey, I'd like to do that, they'd say to me, here's a football, let's see what you can do. They'd see my two left feet and that would be the end of my evangelistic opportunity. <laughs> But, but, but it, what is so good with Dan is that, I mean, if you, if you look at him, he looks exactly la part, doesn't he? In that he's a lovely, gracious Christian who's obviously, he's well known and they love him. They love him. And, you know, you're walking through your ash, oh, Daniel, ciao, Jeff, etc. And we're going to have a conversation. So we, 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 we sponsor Daniel. How should we pray for him? Very quickly before we move on this way. It's a lonely life sometimes in this sort of work. He's the only evangelical football chaplain in Romania and his pressure and his discouragement sometimes we are so happy to help with the finances we help with the finances but still we need the Lord every day don't we to minister to Daniel's dear soul and we pray that the Lord will do that and bless him that way firstly prison ministry family days Cosmin Juju secondly football chaplaincy Daniel Zafiris wonderful work there Thirdly, Ukrainian widows in and around the area of Chernitsi. Let's talk this one through. That's the Ukraine. Normally, a modern day Garden of Eden. Just as a little interest, point of interest, um, in Ukrainian, the word for April, kvitken, kvitten, comes from the word for flower, kvitko, because they're everywhere. And it's so beautiful. And that's what it should be like. A piece of shrapnel. Do you know, it reminded me of a great big splinter. <laughs> yeah. Sharp edges? How much do you think it weighed? I would guess at least 10 kilograms. At least 10 kilograms, John. Yeah. Oh, it was really heavy. It's about, about that thick. Really heavy. Like, like lifting um, a barbell, a dumbbell. If that comes flying at you, it's going through you and the person standing behind. It's not easy. Al, oh, let's go for this one. Let's use our ears for a second, guys. Let's just listen to what's being said. Al, oh, if we can press a play here. Can we press? This is a... Let's see if we can... We're going to have some sound effects. This is... This is Friday evening when we were in the Ukraine last May and see if we can, um, that's the, that's the alarm. The whole city hears. Not like a car, the whole city hears. It means one of two things, either a missile or a drone is coming. The buses stop. The public buildings close. There's a sense of tension because the alarm sounds once, twice, and the third time it sounds, the alarm is over. It was about an hour and a half between the second sound and the third sound when we were there. And you could sense how tense people were. Oh, I think that's it. Yeah. And this, again, it's, it's so touching. It shows the cost people are, are paying. This is um, a tomb. You know, we, right at the very start, we had the, 
the grave, didn't we, on the very first, um, uh, first picture that we had. This is the other side of that, the other side of the grave. Um, this was a young man, 25 years old, who died in the first months of the conflict. But on this, you know, the state to begin with, John, there were these beautiful big graves, so that everyone's a hero, you know, you're going to get it. A big grave, you're a hero in death. But what was so striking was the, the words here. It, it, it says, Hodimo Brami Dorayo. Um, let's go, brothers, to heaven. Let's go to heaven. Because we've already been to hell. Mm. What a statement. Incredible, incredible, incredible. And so, in the Lord's goodness, what we've been able to do is contact this dear pastor and his wife, Pastor Valerie and his wife, Natalia. And what they do, dear ones, each month is to go to 60 families who've either lost a son or lost a husband in the conflict. <coughs> and with the, the, the bag of essential food goes a listening ear a counselling heart and prayer. And it's wonderful. 60 families. Let's meet four of them. Yulia. And this is her son who died. Her only son. A judo champion. May we actually met, in a May we actually met his coach, his judo coach, who said that boy was fearless. He was fearless. After the conflict started on the field, he went into a burning car and pulled out two other soldiers. He was given a medal by the Ukrainian general for that. But on April the 11th, I believe it was, he was shot in the head by a sniper bullet. He was sent home. I'll spare you the details of how he was sent home. I love it. But it was, it was bad. And I will never forget Julia saying, I'm too old to have any more children now. We're so glad every single month Pastor Valerie goes with food, listening ear, counselling and prayer and gospel if, if the opportunities arrive. Oh, wow. Angelika was living in the southeast of the Ukraine with her family. When the conflict started, was terrified, didn't leave the house for 12 weeks in any meaningful way. Eventually, she, her husband, and her, her uh, just one little boy, they, they, they ran for their lives, and they, they ran from the southeast of the Ukraine over to Chernitsi, where we were, which in the, in the southwest. They escaped, but they didn't have anything, so they went to the local authority. They said, we need, a, we need accommodation. We'll give you a house, said the, the local authority. But... Your husband's going to fight. They gave him two weeks training. Put him on the front. And he was shot two weeks later. Essential food. Listening ear. Counselling prayer and the gospel every month. Wonderful, isn't it? Heroism on the field of battle. Tanya. A little bit older, but then some of the soldiers are. Was Her husband was a bear of a man. I saw photographs of him. I mean, he was huge. But he was, um, um, he'd been in the army all his life. He, he'd become a, a sergeant of some sort, and then he'd come out of the army because of age retirement. Conflict starts, and of course he gets back into the army. And I saw photographs of this, this big kind of stubbly face, and he's got his big arms around the, the, you know, the boys, the boys, the 20-year-olds the, the and the 22-year-olds, his big arms protectively around the boys. And they were at the Antonov Bridge when it came under strong Russian attack. Russians had tanks. Ukrainians just had guns. And Tanya's husband shouted, run, boys, run. I'll hold them for as long as I can. They ran. And he was killed. It took Tanya 12 months to get his body brought over back to the, this part of the Ukraine. Food, 
a listening ear, counsel, prayer, and the gospel every month. And finally, this dear man, Miroslav. Dear ones, for just for a few seconds, I'm going to say nothing. Just invite you to look at that dear man's face and posture. Nobody cares, he says. Nobody cares. And then the next thing he said through all his tears when we were at his house, you are the only ones who are helping me. His son was killed. His son was killed. So interesting. Now, well, there are Jehovah's Witnesses who have been trying to get a hold on him. And um, he said he was going to go down to the market hall he was going to say to the Jehovah's Witnesses, he wanted to take a photograph of us, John. He said, here's my telephone, take a photograph. Okay, no problem. And he said, I'm going to go down to the marketplace, see the Jehovah's Witnesses, and say, you know, these are the people who've been caring for me. Food, counselling, prayer, and the gospel, every single Please pray for Pastor Valerie and that lovely family of his there. I love that family. Look at them. Aren't they lovely? Aren't they lovely? Look at them. Please pray, dear ones, for this program. 60 families every month. That's £40 per family. And that's quite a lot of outlay. Please pray for help with that. Please pray for Valerie right now right now why brother Adrian why I'm going to tell you Irene will tell you on Sunday evening I got a whatsapp message from Valerie he said to me John he said brother Adrian pray for me I need to go into the recruiting center for three days yeah, he's only 44 he said they won't be down at the recruiting center he should get exemption he's got six children if you've got three children you don't you, you don't have to fight He's a pastor. Pastor should get exemption. You don't have to fight. But he, he said to me, Brother Adrian, they're breaking the rules left, right, and center. Pray for me. Let's pray for him, John. Let's pray for him, Al. Yeah. You know, that he might know. And I'll, I'll tell you what, if you pray for him, dear ones, I'll send him a WhatsApp message tomorrow morning and say, the dear ones in Kumde were praying for you, Brother Valerie. And it, would, it will mean a huge amount to him. But let us pray for these dear people in the Ukraine, those 60 families. And through it all, as I said, the words of our meditation, that more than the, the love or through the love, each month, they will hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit, the whisper of the Lord Jesus. This is eternal life. Yeah. Even the conflict to know you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Brief. I'm just going to add one thing in. I'd love to go back there tomorrow. I do. I'll, I, I, I find it difficult in the right sort of way when I speak to Valerie because I want to go back there so much. And I just can't do it this, because I've got to go to Romania twice this, this autumn. Maybe we could pray for a, a trip to be organized. I'm the Lord would minister to our dear brother that way. This is their time of need. And he is a messenger of life to those dear people there. Now, just very briefly, number four, Arad in the West, and um, <coughs> ministering to the deaf. <laughs> I'm sure John, probably remember, do you remember John? My dear dad is deaf. Did you remember that? I'd, yeah. yeah, very tall and very deaf. <laughs> and it's just been one of those things from my youth. I remember my dad. He's not totally deaf, but very, very profoundly hard of hearing. Yeah. I remember somebody saying to me that statistically in hung Hungary, there are five times as many deaf people as in Romania. I didn't know that until this person told me, who was a deaf researcher himself, so he knew. And what we are doing is sponsoring this, where is he, there, that dear man, Sami Gorgon. 
who has a deaf fellowship and reaches out to the deaf community around Arad. Um, now, just very briefly, we, 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 we help Sami with a number of things, but this dear couple here, um, this is taken back, I think it was in early 2023. I can just very briefly tell you their story. Um, Sami had known them for years and had done what he could to tell them about the message of eternal life. Uh, a deaf husband and deaf wife. And um, though generally speaking, Sami said the wife was more receptive than the husband. Um, but as time went by and there was no firm commitment, who should turn up at the door but the Jehovah's Witnesses? And the Jehovah's Witnesses have two secret weapons. The first is that they are experts in sign language. Experts. And the second is large, generous gifts. And so they, they got the, the couple into the Jehovah's Witness fold and they were meeting with them for a, for a time. But while they were meeting with them, they could not reconcile these new teachings with what Sammy had said in years past. And so eventually they, they came out. Praise the Lord. And through Sammy's good outreach and witness, it was time to make that fine, final and firm commitment to the Lord. And afterwards they got baptized. And, and there they are. And there they are. And lovely. And John, this dear man here, um, he, <laughs> he, um, in his lovely, simple way, he has an exercise book. And in it he draws pictures of Bible stories. It's lovely. But let us pray for Sammy. We help him, Sammy, in his, his deaf fellowship with the special evangelistic events they hold. Um, this, this woman here is one of three deaf sisters. Um, the eldest died, age 19. Um, this man I know very well. This is another deaf couple. Um, this is a deaf dad with his hearing daughter. This is Sammy's son there. Um, this, this is the, uh, um, yeah, another... And, uh, yes, and, and another um, Jonutz there who was converted, deaf young man who was converted. Let us pray for this wonderful outreach. Let us pray for the, the cults, the cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses to be reined in. And let us pray for Sammy in his ongoing outreach. He knows 200 deaf people in and around the town of Arad. And um, each has a soul. And each needs to have those words sign language to them. This is eternal life, to know you, the living God. Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Dear ones, thank you for your patience. Here's my last, our last area. But we saved the best to last. We're still in Arad. Yeah. Some people said in 1990 there were 60 thousand abandoned children in Romania. I have heard other estimates of 170,000 and I incline towards the latter. It's the difference between one full football stadium and three full football stadiums, which is a colossal And each of those thousands of children has a face. And they matter. You know, in Romanian, maybe Al knows this, they are sometimes called Kopi Nimanui, which is translated the children of no one. When you meet them sometimes, as I've said to people before, it feels like they've come in from the planet Mars. They are totally alone. No father, no mother sometimes, no brothers, no sisters, no one. Very, very hard. The wonderful thing we know is that even today, it's an ongoing problem in Romania. They say a thousand, at least a thousand babies 
are abandoned every year in Romania today. I remember talking to people who'd been into a hospital in Arad who said that in Arad two were being abandoned every week. And the Lord cares for these children. He cares and he calls. Mm. This is David and Flavia Muntian and their um, son and daughter, Vlad and Anna. You know, it was when, back in 2012, that um, um, Vlad, the son there with, with David and Flavia, they were in Romania and Vlad picked up a respiratory infection and was taken into the, the local hospital for about two weeks. And while he was there, David noticed, David the dad noticed that there was, next to Vlad, a very dark-skinned little gypsy boy, six months old, called Tomitsa. Same respiratory infection, coughing, 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 coughing. But no one came to see him. So David asked the Nurses, why does no one come to see Tomitsa? And the nurse said, it's because he's been abandoned. And David was there visiting his son every single day and saw the little guy Tomitsa coughing and nobody there to show kindness. And so eventually he did what I hope all of us would do, which is he bent over the cot and picked up the little guy to show some affection only for one of the nurses to literally come running down the ward, running down the ward. Now, put him down, put him down. What do you think you're doing? Put him down, put him down. David said, no, why should I put him down? This is exactly what the little fella needs. And the nurse came out with these extraordinary words. She said, listen, if you do that, he'll want it all the time. Put him down. David, put him down. Vlad, David's boy, soon came out of hospital and Dave and Flavia were coming back over to Bristol and Bath. And so Dave went up to the nurses and said, I'd like to give you some money, please, to look after that little boy, Tomitsa. But I'd like you to tell me, if I do give you money, will you use it to, to look after that little boy? Will you use the money for the right thing? You promised me that. And they said, no, we give you no promise. I will never forget dear Dave saying to me, Adrian, at least they were honest. But I will never forget Dave, who is a big hulking man. In our coffee shop in Bath in 2021. Sorrowful. And saying to me, Adrian, I have no idea now if Tomitsa is dead or alive. But the Lord redeems even the deep sorrows of his people. And what David and Flavia did, they, they remained in Bristol after that for another seven years. But even in that time, they were always saying to me, Adrian, get involved with abandoned children. Adrian, get involved with the children's homes. And we did. They were always egging us on that way. 2019, they went back to Romania for good and they started to work with uh, abandoned children. And these ones I know very well. Talking to them, listening, sharing the gospel and here bringing them to church meetings. Wonderful. As it should be. But it was in 2021 when David said to me, he said, listen, Adrian, Flavia and I, we have our own house. We don't need anything more. There is another property we were seeking to use as a and b as a bed and breakfast. But I would like to change that now so that it become a, a Christian children's home for 12 abandoned babies, abandoned children in partnership with a local church, Christian members of staff, beautiful location in the countryside. Would you be willing to help us with that? And I still remember saying to him, Dave, listen, 
remain in ministry says the Lord's work. I can't do a thing until I feel, I believe the Lord is moving us ahead with this. And I was so happy after two weeks to be able to say, Dave, I, I believe the Lord is, is in this. And that was the home as it was. <laughs> and that was taken a week ago. It's now extended, it's been painted, it's, it's, it's complete on the outside. And it's <laughs> got to get the equipment now and the, the furnishings. And that's a challenge. And we would value your prayers for that. But that's the vision. My dear friends, we are told of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, that he took children in his arms and blessed them. Normal children. If he had known the abandoned children, Abandoned like litter, abandoned like nothing. What would he have done? Well, we believe he would have made safe places for them. Places of spiritual refuge. Surrounded by Christian love and care. I've been in it for the long term. As we seek to be. And whispered to them in their hurt. This is eternal life. To know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.